Alrighty, and welcome to the next episode of FinOps Fridays. Today I'm here with Devere and we're gonna talk about doing FinOps from an engineering perspective and actually initiating it from an engineering perspective. A lot of the time we talk about FinOps, getting stakeholder engagement and trying to force and get the engineers to sort of do something they naturally don't wanna to do to wrangle them in and try and control them. So we're gonna talk about what happens when FinOps is actually grown and initiated from within engineering. What does that look like? What sort of success does that lead to? So I'm here with Devere. Devere, give us a quick intro. How did you get into FinOps? What's your background? And how did you get into the situation? Thank you. So hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Devere. I joined Wix six years ago to implement the FinOps culture. Uh, but my background is technical. I used to be a DevOps engineer uh, in other companies before I came to the FinOps world. And I think that since then, in the last six years, uh, we've done such a journey that uh, we've become a subject matter expert in cloud financial management in AWS. We're part of the FinOps Kahoot in Google, and we are FinOps practitioners um, with the FinOps Foundation certification program. So awesome. it's been quite, quite a journey. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So in terms of, take me through the approach uh, that was implemented at Wix, sort of give me the, the quick, I mean, summary of, of the whole sort of six years, I guess. You know, what were the main drivers? How did it sort of start and get initiated? Uh, and what were the sort of the main components of FinOps? Uh, things like the solutions that you implemented and you used. Okay, so for that, if that's okay, I want to talk a bit about the, uh, you know, the definition of FinOps by the FinOps Foundation is uh, the evolving culture. And I want to talk a bit about the evolution Wix has gone through, um, because I think a lot of companies are uh, doing the same journey. And I think it gives a lot of value to understand where we came from and why we are here today. So uh, when you said what drove like the biggest changes uh, at the beginning, we didn't know. So as I said, I started in 2017, uh, two years before the Phoenix Foundation was ever founded. And no one called it FinOps back then, right? It, it wasn't FinOps, it was cloud automation, cloud analyst, whatever. And the first phase that we identified was to create visibility on cloud and to understand how we can gain more visibility on what we do and not how much thing costs, but who are, they, or who are the owners and how we can paint them internally in the cloud in order for us to you know, show back, charge back and make sure that we account for every dollar. But that wasn't enough, right? Because we didn't understand uh, why and we didn't understand if that's efficient or not. If you say something is costing $100, uh, it doesn't tell you much, nor to the engineer. So we uh, evolved from visibility into control and we try to understand how we can integrate um, our workloads with the engineering pipelines. So instead of telling people how much thing costs, we wanted to create a pipeline or a flow that will integrate uh, their roadmap and their sprints with the actual uh, costing dashboards and create and participate in the architecture and design of the workloads. Um, furthermore, we said like that's being proactive, but how can we react to changes that are not planned? And we created this whole process of incidents uh, if we have growth or uh, financial incidents that are is a huge uh, spike in our cost with our engineering team, uh, we created a postmortem and we actually did a, an investigation how we could have done things better to try and educate better the engineers. So it's part of their process for incident reporting and postmortems to understand how to do better. Um, yeah, I'd but like that to... wasn't enough. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Well, I want to get into you know things like the, the, those retrospectives. I want to get into that a little bit deeper in a bit. You know, you mentioned you started with visibility, then you went into control. What kicked it off? What what made somebody say, "Hey, we we need to do something about this. There's a problem." What was there a massive cost blowout, or somebody was just ahead of the game? What was that initiator of of change of, of the culture and the instantiation of FinOps? So at the first year, when we started focusing on cost and creating dashboards, so this is the first thing that I did. I created dashboards for different teams and showing them the cost. But as an engineer, you only look at dashboards when something is wrong, right? So when something is off or with something, uh, you look at it once in a while, it's not your own day-to-day -day routine because it shows 
a trend that you're familiar with, for example, for stateful baselines, no one will actually go to the dashboard and see what kind of action items you can generate from and what kind of insights it generates because it doesn't generate any insight. So as I said, if you show someone that their workload is costing $100, it doesn't generate action items. It then doesn't generate uh, uh, understanding if we're efficient or non-efficient. And that's what drove the, the evolution for the change from cost visibility into actionable dashboards and integrating proactively with the engineering pipeline uh, for design and architecture before we provision to make sure that we're efficient before the provisioning and uh, uh, post kind of provisioning, understanding if what was expected is what we provisioned uh, altogether. And if but it's not, interesting again, as I said, yeah, go ahead. And it's interesting that you say like, we cost us $100, is that good? We don't know. The fact that you intrinsically knew that value, you can't measure value with a dollar figure. Exactly. Um, and, and how did you start to chip away at value? Um, is it, it's really good that you recognize that, but then how did you sort of solve that and say, $100 is meaningless. How do we start to understand value there? Do you look at benchmarking? Do you look at competitors? Uh, was it from you know the product management side saying, hey, we need this sort of you know unit metric type of thing? What is it that, and how did you sort of progress on that value chain? Perfect. That's a great question. Um, we when we talk about value on the cloud, it's not about the infrastructure that we run on, and that was the aha moment that we had when we actually look at our cost and look at our efficiency. And you so we started uh, monitoring our utilization, and we you know our workload was efficient, but that word value is elusive because it has nothing to do with how efficient our infrastructure is. It has everything to do with what the infrastructure is there to do for our business. So that was the, 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 the moment when you understood cost doesn't really matter, as you said. Um, the only thing that matters is, is the workload that we're running on the cloud, our investment in the cloud, because we were not spending money on the cloud, right? We were investing on our business. Uh, is my investment smart? And that value KPI became, how can we map our business that is running on top of our workload and how can we make sure it's efficient? And that, that was the, the switch that we did because we moved from cost discussions into efficiency and value discussions. And again, like I'm loving the language, you know, you're talking about, we don't spend on the cloud, we invest in the Ooh, cloud. I have many examples. <laughs> <laughs> Is this, is this a Devere language? Is this the perception that you had that you brought into Wix or this is a Wix culture? Like it just seems as though you were very much five years ago ahead of the game in your perception and the way you approach cloud. Was that already in Wix? Did you bring that to Wix and had to drive it or you brought it to Wix and they easily understood it because you had good people? Talk to me about that because I find that really fascinating, the perception that you basically instinctively had. Um, this is an amazing point. Uh, Wix is an engineering company and we have more than 2000 engineers that work in different, uh, internal companies on different agendas and features. And we're very engineering driven. Our CEO is an engineer and this is a mindset that Wix has, um, to drive more engineering efficiency. Now, when we're talking about engineering efficiency, those are concepts and principles I can understand coming from the engineering world myself. So uh, you wouldn't try uh, a non-efficient or a wasteful code, right? You want to try to make it lean um, with your memory footprint and to make sure that your environment is optimized. It, it's how you write code efficiently, or this is how you provision workloads efficiently. So why would you run in a wasteful environment? or a non-efficient environment. And that KPI, when we moved or shifted the uh, left, that conversation from uh, you're costing too much to you're not efficient and you're wasteful in the way that you work, uh, that triggers the engineering ego, right? Like, <laughs> it, it's just like, I, I wanna be efficient. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things. Um, and those are the best practices in the industry. And this is how we presented it to them. 
Like we want to make sure that you're running efficiently with your workloads the same way that you want to be efficient as an engineer. That's, a, That's an easier concept to understand than cost, right? No, and, and, and again, like I'm just loving the language here. You <laughs> sort of, it's not the cost because as an engineer and as an employee, it's not coming out of my salary. I don't care, not yeah. my money, not my worry. So telling somebody that your cost is bad, it's not my cost. But telling them it, it's your job, it is your performance, your efficiency, it is the code, it is you that's bad. They can't just meh. Like it really does strike exactly. them at their core as an employee and as you know more of a personal um, performance metric. So I really love that the fact that you're you're tying this as as a personal problem and a performance issue versus saying hey look a random dollar when dollars don't really matter. Exactly, and also the conversation and the trust that you build. Uh, is a lot stronger because you still value and understand other engineering KPIs. Like if someone will tell me this is my reliability and redundancy and the way that I want to do it because it improves my performance, everything is fine and you speak the same language because everyone's talking about that challenge, common language, right? And everyone's shifting right, or I don't know if it's shifting right, but everyone's Shifting to the financial aspect of like teach engineers showback, chargeback, teach engineers how much they cost and the dollar value. Why? <laughs> Why that? I mean, the common language for the engineers is to make sure that they're efficient. And that's how you want to approach them because eventually they're their procurement team now, right? They, they own the budget, they own how they impact it. And we, our, our job, uh, at least as I see it, is to make sure that we give them the tools and knowledge to, uh, to do uh, better and to understand how to approach things in a smart way and to educate them about different pricing plans or different services. As you said, how can we understand the TCO of a compute unit economic in different clouds or let's say let's move this workload to on-premises and that, those are the discussions that we're having today at Wix. Like the TCO of each workload and how we can look at it in different services, if it's managed or not managed, creating models to understand how our on-premises would look because we do have on-premises data centers and which kind of workloads we want to shift into those. And that's a discussion worth having with engineers because you get to keep your KPI of cost, but they're engaged with your agenda. Yeah, nice, nice. And in terms of um, some of the solutions that you implemented, you know, you mentioned things like visibility, uh, you mentioned things like some metrics, how do you measure an engineer? What would you say are the main categories of solutions um, that you sort of implemented in terms of FinOps inside of Wix? Okay, so we have our own internal tool that I've built in the past. I used to also code a bit. Um, and I've built a, it started as a hello world kind of a project, uh, just to make sure to understand what kind of information the cloud has. So if we're talking about this journey at Wix, then we started uh, six years ago with a third party vendor and we created those dashboards in the platform and everything was nice until we didn't see correlation between the cost that was given to us in the dashboard and the cost that we saw in the cloud. And ah, most so of them, lack of trust, the lack of trust is yeah. like, bang, there it is. Yep. It's it, it just like that, right? Because once you have an incident that you can't trust the numbers, then it kind of uh, closed that deal on the that, that vendor. Um, and I think that at the time, 2017, right? Uh, most of them, what they did with shared costs, for example, data transfer or support, they just allocated it randomly based on like capacity of other workloads or, right? They, they just push it differently. So I want to understand how much my somebody, costs. Yeah, somebody made yeah. an assumption and forced <laughs> their assumption onto your business. Exactly. And for me, it didn't make sense. Uh, so we, we, I just want to understand like what kind of information they rely on. And back then, for example, in Amazon, they had a DPR, the detailed billing report. And in Google, you still had to export your uh, billing to BigQuery. And those were the main clouds that we worked on. Uh, so I just, you know, downloaded the DBR, the detailed billing report, just so the columns, like the information I have, 
I said, oh, that's a CSV file. Let's just push it into MySQL and I can, you know, drop it in Elasticsearch, put it in a, as a data source in Grafana. <coughs> and I have like amazing dashboards for the same information they show me. And that's how it started. And since then, yeah. we, it just blew like tens of thousands of lines of code uh, doing like best practices, like detached TBS, elastic IPs, and uh, multi-part uploads that uh, incomplete, and you know, right sizing, integrating with CloudWatch and Prometheus uh, in our internal systems, and you know, everything just coming together into this amazing uh, data pool that we can draw insights, not just cost, right, but insights on our business, how much request I'm getting in my application layer, and how much a request cost in my business and how much transfer into Kafka, how much it's received, uh, who produces, like what's the capacity, how I can allocate snowflake costs and shared costs internally at Wix. Uh, it's, it's an amazing project. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. So I want to go a little bit deeper in terms of things like FinOps onboarding. You know, we spoke about the technical side of things. Um, there's, of course, solutions and tools that will help but if an engineer is constantly doing the wrong thing, it's just a terrible place to be. You're going to be reworking. It's going to be incredibly inefficient. Um, in terms of your success in FinOps uh, and having the capability in people, how do you address this? What does onboarding at Wix look like? Uh, you know, is if I talk about an engineer's onboarding, not just the FinOps onboarding specifically, like how big is FinOps a part of their overall onboarding? And it, it seems efficiency is just first and foremost throughout the mindset of, of Wix. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I think it's very big because as I said, we try to integrate the FinOps mindset as part of the engineering journey internally at Wix. And it starts with actual onboarding, right? So when an engineer, the, uh, anyone coming to system provisioning DevEx, everyone has a, an onboarding kind of process, which has to go with different phases. One of the phases is FinOps. What is important for us? Where can you find visibility on workloads related to your workload? And we really try to, you know, uh, educate them at the beginning and make sure that we have that um, collaboration between the teams. And two things we implemented at Wix, a lot of more, but uh, two things that are made to this question was a, a request for comment, RFC. When we try to design a new project and we want to implement it, um, there is a process writing everything that you want to do, want to achieve, like what's the current state, what's the desired state, what's the solution that you want to aim and how it solves the problems stated in the RFC. And what's beautiful about it is we have three fields related to FinOps. Uh, is it under budget? Is it budgeted as part of the yearly budget? If not, what is the expected budget? And we help creating that model and it's a mandatory field, so you gotta have to do it. Uh, and the last one is the approval process. So we have a table of approvals. We have security and we have networking and the platform, but we also have FinOps. So we have to sign on large agendas. And I'm only talking about large agendas. So if you want to provision a, a database that is used only for development, no one's stopping you. But if you want to provision like this performance agenda costing uh, half a million dollar a year, um, that's going to turn out as an RFC and created a review. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing that how we create education tweaks is what I mentioned before, uh, the whole process of incident management. And if we have a financial incident, it doesn't matter if it's a human error or a wrong provisioning or a different architecture that was discussed. Uh, we create an incident, we open it, uh, everyone, all the stakeholders are involved. We create a postmodern. If they, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll go deeper on the incident uh, at the moment. One thing I wanted to, you know, you mentioned in terms of, you know, you've, you've got good integration of FinOps into your standard business practices. FinOps yep. sits equal with security, with architecture, which, which is absolutely great to hear. That's there as part of a mandatory field. Uh, and you've spoken about FinOps as part of onboarding. Yeah. Uh, and I love to tell people, you know, that the first place you need to do FinOps is at your interview. Every single person that comes into your question, doesn't matter what the answer is, but they're, if they're asked about FinOps, then it tells them, hey, we care about this here. This is something you need to kind of know about. And it, it just sets that tone for culture. Um, have you always yeah. done, uh, do you have anything like that? And when is the earliest that sort of people understand that, hey, FinOps, is it part of job descriptions? 
Have you taken it to that level? Um, no, unfortunately. So that's a, that's a good suggestion. I'm going to take it. <laughs> like interview, yeah, and it's, like for... yeah, and it's, it's an easy one because you just say that every, you know, and it's great KPI. Every single job interview or 80% of the job interviews, uh, obviously in our line of work, uh, in our business, it makes sense for even the salespeople to understand FinOps. But ask them two or three questions about FinOps, don't care about the answers, but it just sets that tone. It plants that seed that, hey, this is important stuff that they do here at the very, very first gate. That's amazing. I'm going to take it. That's a great suggestion. So. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. And the other thing I always love to do is KPIs, is to make sure that when people start, one of their key KPIs, it's in their job description. You know, if, if you continually build platforms that get hacked and failed and fall over, poor performance. If you build platforms that cost too much and are proven to be inefficient, why do you still have a job? Like th that has exactly. to be the, the mindset as well. So I think that the only thing that is missing from your sentence is how to define that things are costing too much. Like I would invest $1 million in an agenda if it generates $2 million, right? <laughs> so cost too yeah. much is a, it's an elusive term to understand if we're really efficient or not. Yeah, and it, you know, it depends on where the company is, the, the you know, startup with plenty of cash, things like that. Exactly. I, I leave that rubbery so people <laughs> I don't force that upon them. Um, in terms of, uh, well, we'll take a quick break. So we'll do our speed round questions. Uh, so this is where we get to know our guest on a little bit more of a personal level. Take a break from FinOps before we jump back in. So Devi, are you ready for the speed round questions? I am. All right. <laughs> Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Beetroot on your burgers? No. <laughs> Okay, cat or a I know it's person. interesting, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's typically Australian. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I know, but, but meat is, is sacred, so. <laughs> I understand, I understand. Uh, cat person or a dog person? Oh, uh, definitely a dog, so. <laughs> ah, nice, nice. Uh, red wine or white wine? Red wine. Uh, beer or spirits? Oh, it depends on the mood. I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, do you ask permission or beg for forgiveness? Beg for forgiveness, definitely. <laughs> uh, your Not favorite. <laughs> uh, your favorite movie director producer genre. Ooh, um, I don't have one. I'm sorry. Like I have a lot of good movies that I saw, but none of none, none of them is my favorite biggest one. Is there a genre? Is there, is there a particular genre or director or? No, it can be a horror film. It could be action. It can be drama. Like that's why I don't Diversity. have one because I like, yeah. <laughs> um, tea or coffee? Coffee. That was a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> like what I want um, and what I need. So let's go with what I need. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your favorite TV series? Um... Well, well, it changed during the years, right? So I, I really loved Suits, but um, there are plenty that are amazing. It's, it's very hard to choose. <laughs> uh, your favorite song, musician, genre of music? Uh, that will be Dream Theater, John Petrucci. I have a guitar signed with his name. So I met him in uh, New York uh, in a guitar universe kind of boot camp he did. So it was awesome. Wow. Uh, yeah, I saw Dream Theater when they came to Australia uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, about 20 years late, what everyone wanted, but it was <laughs> phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Amazing. Um, yeah. Your favorite food? Meat. <laughs> it has to be meat, yeah. All the animals, just for all the animals. Yep. I know, I've built you that uh, answer, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We but, worked yeah. up to it. Um, when you're on holiday, do you prefer activities or just relaxing and doing nothing? Relaxing. At this point of my life, that's that'll be just laid back. <laughs> uh, do you prefer buildings and architecture or nature? Nature, definitely. Nice. If I'm already um, traveling, then it will be nature. Your preferred superpower, supernatural ability? <sighs> well, that's a good one. Um, never thought about it. 
Let's go with um, the ability to change statistics. Any particular types of statistics? No, everything. Like I can change the, 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 the way that I can win lottery or that I won't be hit <laughs> by a speeding car or that I'll be, you know, <laughs> that bullet will dodge me. And <laughs> I don't know. Nice. I think it's a cool power. <laughs> uh, your favorite vacation location? Uh, New Zealand. You've been there before? Yeah. Nice. For nice. three months. Yeah. It was amazing. Do you prefer to text or talk? It depends with who. <laughs> <laughs> um, Take note, everyone. Usually... <laughs> yeah, if I want text point you, fingers, like... but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna be text. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, childhood nickname, if it's safe. Uh, Tulik. Like the flower, but with a K at the end. So. <laughs> ah. Uh, your proudest moment um my kids like both of them no specific one <laughs> <laughs> which one do you text or talk to mostly uh, the big one <laughs> <laughs> excellent so that brings us to the conclusion and you scored a very respectable 94 and a half Ooh. Thank you. Ah, nicely, nicely. All righty, and we'll have got the we're back into FinOps. This will be the last question before we break for the second half of the episode. Um, and you mentioned this before. We wanted to get into this one. This is the first time I've I've heard this really implemented. In that, a finance incident is finally treated the same way as an operations incident. And this is to me one of the things. If you're really going to be impactful, if you're really taking FinOps seriously is that the FinOps has to be taken as seriously as things like security, things like operations. When something costs too much, it's poor job performance and there's a problem in the organization. We need senior stakeholders to step in. They need to indicate that it's a big problem. Uh, what does this look like at Wix uh, and how do you treat those financial incidents? Okay, so this is a, a great question, but it's a multi-part question because the first phase will be to understand what is an incident and what is growth? So it's, it's not straightforward for any company to do that kind of differentiation because when you see growth, for example, in my application learner, if my oil scaling kicked in, that means more traffic. If I have more traffic, then the cost makes sense because we grew as part of the business. So that's growth. It can be unplanned, it can be unbudgeted, but it's still growth. I can't open an incident report of a platform that is doing exactly what I aimed her to do, right? It to do. Um, so that's the first differentiation we have in that process, in that flow, is to identify what is natural growth of the business versus what's in uh, what is an actual incident of cost. And once we identify it based on the business that is running on the workload and or based on the configuration or changes um, in our repositories, in our, our Terraform, uh, we do that quick investigation to understand if that was a change made by the human or a change made by business. And once we identify its growth, uh, let's just put that aside. Uh, we have a flow saying, how can we budget it, apply uh, the uh, visibility for the different stakeholders in the company and make sure that we update our uh, monthly and yearly run rate based on that new agenda or new traffic or new feature. Putting that aside, let's focus on the incident kind of flow. Um, if it's an incident and we understand there was a human error or there was a misconfiguration, uh, let's give a, a, a classic example. Uh, someone um, created integration to S3 without a proper endpoint. So it going out to the internet, going back in. Um, it, it happens, right? Especially if you're using infrastructure as code and you miss a uh, different flag or something like that. Um, once we identify that's the issue, we're going to open a uh, financial incident, which is exactly how you open a production incident. It has the same field. What happened when, how, can you, how did we identify the growth or the incident and how um, it was mitigated and what was the solution? Now, if the cost impact is less than, let's say, X dollars, we finished that. We had a, a review, we sat with the team, we talked about how to do things better, 
create that educational layer at, on top of that incident. But if it was I like that, I like that because you're not going to spend like hours of a dozen of important people's time on something that costs fifty dollars. You've actually got checks to say let's not put too much effort into something if the problem wasn't that big. Yeah, uh, I, I did an academy in Israel for FinOps. It was free, like forty hours, um, eight weeks, and one of the things that we talked about there is to understand. Um, that the most important skill that FinOps has to have is soft skills, our soft skills. And you have to be a people person. You have to, you know, uh, do everything in a good manner and you have to build trust. And for that, it doesn't matter how technical you are. You have to build that trust. So we wanted to engage with them in a, in a way that won't be impactful on their workload or on their day to day, their sprint but also not in a bad way. We wanted to, you know, do it in a very nice and approaching way to educate better, not to, you know, stick and carrot. So we don't have a stick uh, for incidents less than X dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so that's there. Uh, so we did that, uh, that, that uh, separation because we didn't want people to feel like they're being monitored or policed, right? So. And it's, it's good that you identify that as an education on the learning opportunity, not necessarily a, I like that, that you put that spin on it. Well, again, it's, it's coming from the engineering side. As when you do incident for production, it's the same thing. It's not to blame, it's to learn, right? So, uh, so it's the same process. Uh, that's why we said engineering FinOps, it's not operations. Operations will, you know, hit you dead. But engineers will tell you, uh, let's do better, at least in my perspective. Maybe I'm biased because I'm an engineer, but you know. <laughs> um, okay, so on above X dollars, uh, the, the financial incident is not enough. And we're doing a post-mortem. And we try to uh, pinpoint that failure process. And to, we try to understand how we, as a FinOps group, can give the tools or better mechanism or better visibility uh, to the different engineering teams in order to avoid such pitfalls in, in the future. And that's how we, you know, it's not just about uh, engineering at this point, it's about us and our team and how we can do better in order to avoid those kinds of incidents. So what was missing and uh, if it was knowledge, then how can we create a guild day and, you know, uh, talk about the different services that we use and how the pricing plan uh, work and how we can architecture better models in order for the teams to understand if we're doing better or worse during time, uh, over time, I, sorry. So. And I love that. It's, it's that really nice, more mature approach in that it's not how do we get rid of the waste, how do we clean this, but how do we stop it? The focus is on prevention, waste avoidance versus getting better and better at cleaning it up. Not, okay, let's exactly. go and search for more of this. It's like, well, how do we prevent this? That's the focus. That's the first thing you thought. I really like it. It's such a mature outlook on it. Thank you so much. And I think it, it makes me crazy looking at the market today and everyone's like, my platform is proactive. But no, <laughs> I mean, everything's reactive to cost today. Everything. You're going to take all your insights from cost. And if it's in cost, it's already too late. So we really wanted to, you know, as you said, stop it at the, at the interview point, like the, the first kind of entry point into the platform. So I really want to, you know, integrate FinOps before you provision. So we also implemented uh, InfraCost, which is a, a framework showing you how much your changes in uh, infrastructure is called, uh, is called uh, uh, like in Terraform. It shows you what the cost impact will be in your infrastructure. So an engineer can do a change in Terraform and already see what the cost impact will be and we build a wrapper around it, which is amazing because that's how you, you know, not just share the cost of the of uh, 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 the different workloads and changes to the engineer, you also, you know, engage with them because you, you uh, lift up that KPI in front of their eyes. And it's not just a vague kind of agenda, but also part of the, their uh, process, their, their uh, uh, push pull request their uh, uh, changes in the infrastructure. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. So <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it's it's great that you've got that visibility, which is 
some things that, that something that a lot of people struggle with. But not only do you have that visibility, again, it's built into their process. They don't have to go and, and check. They don't have to open up the pricing files and start to do all the calculations. As part of just doing their job, it's built into the tooling. It scales very well. It's massively efficient. And it, it's there when they do something. They don't have to step out of their workflow to go and get that. It, it's a really interesting story to hear that, that it is so nicely worked into their day-to-day -day life. Yeah. It just works. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, like I love to talk about, um, yeah, the, the focus that people have on waste reduction versus waste prevention. And I was, spoke about this at um, our TBM conference recently last year and explained most of the people there were sort of more execs and finance. And I said, I love to talk about the total cost of waste where yes, there's waste from building it, but then you've got to find it. You've got to pay to find it. You've got to speak to people. Then you've got to pay to remove it, have some meetings. Did it get removed? Did we performance test? That gets really expensive. That sort of finding and removal of waste, which really goes against the efficiency. And I said, well, if you want to get good at removing waste, you've got to get good at creating lots of it. And you're going to have to keep doing that. If you want to succeed at removing waste, you've got to create it, which means you've got to suck at cloud. And then people started to understand that, that like, yeah, we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to keep focusing on getting better at removing waste because that means we're going to have to really suck at it. Um, and it was yeah. good to see people actually have that <laughs> moment that I get it now. It's about avoidance of waste and behaviors and changes in that. And you're just doing it. You're doing it really well. Love to hear that. Thank you so much. And it's an amazing insight. I mean, that's how I think the evolution of FinOps where it will be in the next few years. People will stop talking about cost reduction because it, it's important, you know, to reduce costs, but it's also important to implement processes that prevent it in the first place. We probably want to talk about that after this year gets done, though, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that is the end of the first half of this episode. If you've got any feedback, you've got any questions, you can reach out to us at finopsfridays at aptio.com. So stay tuned for the second half of the episode.